What's going on, everybody? Tom Lauer here. Hey, it's just a little bit before 1 p.m. here on the West Coast. And I figure everyone's kind of in need of just some, some good social interaction, some good live broadcast stuff. So normally my videos are obviously full production videos, but it makes sense to hop in here, get right into the nitty gritty of what people want to talk about right now and what people really want to learn about. So I welcome everyone. We're going to talk just a very basic, simple explanation of our immune system, how it works with antibodies. And I've got some really fun analogies to help you kind of, I don't know, get through this tough time and really understand what your body is capable of. Because I think right now we tend to think just it's all doom and gloom. And I want everyone to be able to just learn how their bodies work. And I think that this is a fun time. For me, I want to be able to leverage YouTube right now for a sense of community. Normally, my channel is all about just uh, pumping out information. Well, now is the time to create community. And now is the time to be able to get everyone on board and just get excited about health. Because to be completely honest, right now, we have a very clean slate to just be able to start fresh and get really, really healthy. Okay, Maybe this is all happening because we all just need some subconscious wake-up call to get healthy. So anyhow, we're going to talk about antibodies. I've got a fun James Bond analogy that's going to make that all make sense. We're going to talk about immunoglobulin A. We're going to talk about uh, IgM. All this stuff that sounds very complicated, but is actually quite basic. So we'll have fun with it. Uh, before I go any further with any of this, it's very important that anyone that's watching this video knows that I am not a doctor, okay? Although I'm passionate about this stuff and I love talking about it and I love translating the complex subject matter the best that I can, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an infectious disease expert. I cannot comment on how this virus works because I'm not an infectious disease expert. Let me fix my microphone here. So I just wanted everyone to know that, okay, I'm not here to save the day. What I am here to do is teach you about your immune system and what you can do to help support your immune system through your diet and to really get the most out of your immune system. Okay, you are born with an immune system, okay? You are born with an immune system that has the ability to fight things off and it has the ability to combat viruses. It has the ability to combat pathogens and that's what's unique about it. So if we understand exactly how that process works, then, I don't know, we can understand feed it. So we're going to dive into that too. We're going to talk about specific vitamins, some minerals, things like that. Uh, first thing, we're going to talk about antibodies. Everyone here has heard of antibodies, right? Okay. If, if you've heard of antibodies, go ahead and just comment antibodies, but also do want to make sure everyone watch uh, comments where they're watching from. Okay. That just helps out a lot in terms of just and everything like that. So antibodies, the purpose of the antibody is to essentially bind to a pathogen and neutralize it. Okay, that's essentially what's going on. So when you have a virus or when you have a pathogen that's coming into your body, what's happening is these antibodies come in and they actually surround the pathogen and almost put a layer around it. Okay, so if you envision a virus coming in your body, you have antibodies that come in and they encapsulate it. Okay, and when they encapsulate it, allows that virus to be excreted and processed, okay, all told and processed. And that's what we're really after. But the thing is, we have a number of different antibodies that we really have to think about. And I just want to encourage people to know exactly what they are. The first one that I want to talk about is one called IgG. Okay, so we have five different kinds of antibodies. Okay, we have IgG, we have IgA, we have IgM, we have IgE, and then we have one that we don't know a whole lot about, which is called IgD. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on IgD. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each and one individually, but I think it's important. Again, this is the time for us to educate ourselves and to, to learn about our bodies. Uh, Eric, what's going on in Toronto? Cassandra, what's going on in Arkansas? What's going on Luna in Canada? Tel Aviv, Philip, good to see you here. Haley in Pennsylvania. We got El Malco in Northern Italy. Kate Williams in California. Suzanne in Michigan. We got uh, Brussels in the house. Wow, we've got Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've got Damian Nightingale, IG88. I'll talk about that one a little bit. We've got uh, Clegs12, uh, awesome. Good to see you in Oklahoma. We've got Toronto in the house. We've got Noah in North Korea. We've got, uh, wow, so many people. Make sure you just continue to comment where you're watching from. It helps out a lot. And I am sorry about the lighting. I'm outside because baby's inside napping and I tend to sometimes get loud when I do these live broadcasts. So I know the lighting's not great. I know my complexion probably looks terrible in this lighting, but who cares, right? It's all this about doing a live. So go ahead and smash that thumbs up button. Get some people on this broadcast if you can. Give it a big share. Anyhow, let's go ahead and let's jump in. So IgGs, when you think general antibody, you think IgG. Okay, that's what we are thinking when we think of just a general antibody. But the fact is we have a bunch more. See, IgG is the antibody that's built by immunization. Okay, so whether it's... Um, exposure to a virus through actual exposure or through vaccine or anything, 
it is the IgG that is kind of just the overarching, just initial antibody, the big antibody that we think of. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that because it's just kind of the big picture. But we want to look at some more interesting ones. We start looking at IgA antibodies. IgA antibodies are going to be what's called immunoglobulin A. And these are the types of antibodies that are produced after, or excuse me, that are usually like uh, produced in the mucosal area. Okay, so you see them a lot in the respiratory tract. You see them in the saliva. You see them in the mucus. Okay, and really it's the job of these ones to neutralize things as soon as they're really coming in. So it, it keeps the pathogens from sticking to what's called an epithelial cell. So what that means is if you have, if you breathe in a virus, you breathe in a pathogen, it's going to get caught up in your mucus and IgM is, or excuse me, IgA is going to be the one that kind of comes in and helps kind of neutralize it at that point. The reason that I mention this is because we do need to take care of our mucous membranes. We do need to take care of our mucus. We do need, because it's a good thing. It's actually protecting us. So a lot of times you see this inflammation and it's occurring in the respiratory system and it's occurring in the lungs, it's occurring in the nose, it's occurring in these mucosal areas because that's exactly what it's supposed to do. It's triggering more of these antibodies. It's triggering more of an immune response in that specific area, helping protect us. Okay, it's a very normal response. So it keeps them from sticking to the epithelial cells and actually getting into the body, okay? Now, we also see a lot of IgA reaction in people with celiac disease, for instance. Okay, that's why when you look at people that have a gluten issue, they have celiac disease because it affects their mucosal layer of their gut. Okay, so that's an IgA issue. For whatever reason, their bodies are seeing gluten as a foreign invader, and it's triggering inflammation in the mucosal layer of their intestinal tract. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I can make some speculations as to a lot of times when you get a cold, a lot of times you also do feel a little bit of a stomach upset too, because perhaps your mucosal layers are all having an issue simply because of that IgA response, right? Anyhow, that kind of covers that. So basics, IgG, IgA, those are really the two big ones that we focus on a lot. Um, and so many people hopping on here. And again, I just encourage people to be here just so we can just talk and hang out because life is a little bit different right now. I mean, obviously I'm still going to be doing my normal live broadcast, but I want to help people get through this. And when I go through this live broadcast, I'm going to also be giving you some tips on things that you can do to improve your immune system to the best of your ability. Granted, your immune system to some degree is what you are born with, but there's also things that you can do to help support that immune system when we start understanding how the actual antibodies work. Okay, so then we look at what's called IgM. Okay, so IgM is another antibody. So this is usually the one that comes in when you first get an infection. Okay, so basically, how do I explain this? Um, right after a pathogen enters the body, you usually have some IgM response. Okay, so usually you're gonna get um, big surge of IgM. And what's going to happen is the same IgM is recognized whenever you have like a reinfection. Now I'm going to give you a simple example here. Uh, herpes, for instance. Okay. The same, the reason that people can have an initial infection, but when they get immunocompromised, they have it surface again. That's an exact example. I know it might be a little bit graphic for people to really think about. And I know it's whatever. The point is, is that that's just a perfect example of something that gets reactivated in the body and typically is an IgM response. Okay. Now let's jump over and let's talk IgE for just a second. I want you to understand how closely correlated the immune system uh, with like a viral infection versus say like an allergic reaction is. Very, very similar. So with an allergic reaction, you have what is called an IgE response. So if I was allergic to say like peanuts or something like that, and I were to consume, um, consume peanuts, I would have an influx of IgE, okay? That is an immunoglobulin, an antibody that is there to react and to fix and correct uh, the fact that I just consumed something that as far as my body's concerned is a toxin, right? Is a poison. So it goes and it works hard to neutralize that. Well, it causes something called a histamine reaction, which is exactly why you take an antihistamine. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time there because obviously we're not talking about allergies with it, whatever's, what is it on everyone's mind? Excuse me. Anyhow, moving on into what's called IgD. So <laughs> IgD is found also in the early stages of an immune response, but there's not a whole lot known about it. They don't seem to circulate. Basically what it means is it signals other cells to become active because they're bound to what are called B cells, which are made in like our bone marrow and things like that, which I'll talk a little bit more about that. Point is, is that we don't understand a lot of these IgD. And I know a lot of this is complicated and I'm gonna try to make it super simple, but I had to get this overarching just explanation first, okay? Our immune system is like James Bond. Okay, basically what ends up happening is 
we have part of the immune system that goes through and tags a cell. Okay, it, or excuse me, doesn't, well, it can tag a cell, but it tags a pathogen. Okay, it circulates through the body. And if you think of James Bond, for instance, James Bond is going to go through and he's going to um, try to save the world. He's trying to save your body, okay? And we have a villain, right? Well, that villain needs to know you know, where James Bond is, right? So there's a, all kinds of different tracking that's going on. Well, it's the job of essentially the antibodies to go through and place a GPS target on whatever pathogen is there. That way, James Bond can come in and kill it, right? That's the simplest thing. We have cells that float through the body. Okay, we have T cells. They float through the body and they put a tag on anything that's a pathogen. And they put a tag on this pathogen so that our body's innate immune system can come in and attack it. Well, the hard part is, is that when it's a new invader, it takes us time. It takes us time to be able to combat that villain, right? So if you think of your body, once again, as just you know a city and you have chaos that's happening because a new virus comes in, it's going to take time for James Bond to go in and actually neutralize this because it's taking time for the labels to get placed on all the different pathogens. It takes time. And that's why you end up getting sick because during the time that you are repairing and building antibodies and fighting this thing off, you're dealing with an inflammatory response, which is what's making you sick and sometimes causing some serious damage, right? It's all in the hope that next time you come into contact with said virus or said thing, you're going to have the GPS target already on it, okay? It's like almost like a parolee, right? It's like the GPS target is there. So if a problem occurs and they see that something is wrong, they can find it immediately and neutralize it, right? So that's exactly, these birds, <laughs> this happened last time too. That's just a very simple explanation. Now, when you break that down into different categories that I explain with IgG, IgA, everything like that, well, then you understand that there's multiple different GPS targets. Okay, there's multiple different forms of James Bond. There's James Bond that is kind of the universal James Bond that regulates everything. There's the James Bond that regulates just the mucosal area. There's the James Bond that regulates uh, the histamine and the allergic reactions. And then there's the James Bond that actually regulates the beta cells, or excuse me, the B cells, not the beta cells. And so you have all this different just activity occurring in our bodies. So then we have to look at, okay, well, how do we support this? And this is exactly what we're wanting to look at, right? How do we support this? How do we take care of our immune system? How do we, you know, really look at this? So anyhow, you know, that's when we start looking at different B vitamins and everything that we're going to talk about here in just a second. So I want to take this time. If anyone has any questions in the meantime, before I dive into the nutrients, before I dive into that piece, go ahead and hit them. I'm happy to answer. FYI, anyone that's watching this broadcast tomorrow, I am posting up a meal plan video simply because I figured a lot of people kind of on limited supply right now, they don't have a whole lot of different foods and they might need a good meal plan. So I, I'm posting up a meal plan video that walks through um, a keto meal plan, intermittent fasting meal plan, and also some strategies for people that aren't doing keto. So anyhow, it's gonna be able to help you out a lot, I hope, and it's all with like limited food supply. So, okay, so you got a good few good questions. Yeah, Primus, there's, there's some haters on the court. There's always gonna be haters on here. Um, Henger says, Thomas, you know more than most docs out there. I wouldn't say that. I think doctors are really, they know a lot, but the hard part is they don't always do a good job translating it. Um, what are my thoughts on echinacea? You know, from an antioxidant standpoint, echinacea is pretty powerful, but I don't think that it's going to really save the day. Um, what's the best thing to implement during a stressful time like we are facing now for your overall health? That's a really good question. You know, I think I could go down a mindset rabbit hole, but I think the biggest piece here is, um, well, I hate to say it, but you know, if we can control inflammation a little bit more, then our bodies are going to be in a better position to be able to fight off whatever we could be experiencing. Um, you know, I don't care what anyone's beliefs are with everything that's going on. I don't care where people stand with it. The fact is, is it's a virus that we don't know a lot about. And that is what's scary, right? So I think the best thing that we can do is just allow ourselves to be as resilient as possible. I'm taking this time to actually allow myself to catch up on sleep. I know. I mean, I'm taking this time to not overtrain. I'm taking this time for my body to recover because when I'm on, I'm on. And this is a period for me to be, you know what? I need to pause a minute because everyone needs to pause. And nature has an interesting way of making this all happen for us forcefully sometimes. We need to relax, we need to calm down, and we need to allow ourselves to actually de-stress so that we don't contract whatever's going around, right? Um, anyhow, let's see. Uh, Almond Birds says, very considerate of you to draw such relatable correlations for people. I'm doing what I can here, and definitely, um, 
U-Haul says missing puzzle piece, flax seed. Oh, you know what? Looks like once again, the chat box seems to have disconnected here. I'm gonna have to open the chat in a different box. Hang on one second, guys. I don't know why it keeps doing this. I did this last time too. Bear with me one moment. There we go. Guys, I have to look at the chat over here just because it popped up. There we go. Now we go. Does vitamin C form oxalates and cause kidney stones? There's conflicting evidence on that, to be completely honest. Oxalates aren't always a bad thing. Oxalates can help chelate excess iron in the gut, which can actually be a huge contributor to a poor immune system, believe it or not. You know, if you look at iron, basically excess iron makes excuse me, makes it hard for, and if magnesium can't do its job, then you cannot synthesize vitamin D. And if you cannot synthesize vitamin D, then you don't have that kind of relationship between vitamin C and vitamin D that works so well together. Hello from Greece, what's going on? Uh, have you heard of elderberry being detrimental to the treatment of a virus? You know, elderberry, I don't know what it is about elderberry, to be completely honest. It, it does have a little bit of vitamin C, but it doesn't really seem to do a whole lot in the way of other things. So probably doesn't play a big role. Um, Thomas, given the fact that taking zinc is crucial these days, what's the best time to take zinc? Before food, with food, and how much? I usually like to say take zinc a little bit before your meal in most cases, because if your meal contains copper, which a lot of meals do, you end up depleting the zinc because they counteract each other. So I hope that that helps a little bit. So I would usually recommend taking zinc a little bit before a meal, let it break down a little bit, but that way you're taking it close to a meal so you don't potentially get an upset stomach with it. Uh, garlic, so garlic's antioxidant properties mainly have to do with something called allicin. And that is largely more of an anti-tumor and an anti-cancer property. Of course, it's very good for bacterial infections. Okay, people have seen that. I've seen it firsthand that garlic is very powerful when it comes down to antibacterial situations. Um, it doesn't look like for the most part what we're dealing with right now is bacterial. So, however, a lot of the secondary infections and everything that are going on. So anyhow, uh, someone says, hey, Thomas, loving the content. I've been taking CBD for anxiety and inflammation. It's working wonders. Uh, worried that it will reduce my immune system. Also, will there be supply chain issues? I wish I could answer that. I don't honestly know. A lot of the evidence is just too dang new. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Um, people are asking, should they fast right now? This is obviously a common question on my channel since I do a lot of fasting content. Um, my common answer for this is, if you are adjusted to fasting, by all means, do, don't change something, okay? Continue to do your normal fasting regimen. If you're new to fasting, I don't recommend you embark on a fasting lifestyle now. Why? Because it's very natural for the first phase of fasting to get exhausted, to have a cortisol spike, to get stressed out. It's difficult on your body at first. So if you're adapted to it, you're probably in a great spot and you don't really need to change a whole lot. Uh, but if you're not, I don't recommend now as a time to start doing it in an effort to boost your immune system because it does boost your immune system in the long haul. And I have some evidence in that and I have a video coming out next week on that. But what it also does is it temporarily compromises your immune system if you're not adjusted to it because your body's kind of in fight or flight mode. So I just want you to be very, very careful with that. Same kind of thing with starting keto. I wouldn't suggest people start keto right now because it's just, it's a rough time. Any, any evidence that you look at with the first phase of keto, you have an increase in cortisol levels. It's that fat adaptation period where you're taking the mitochondria that's normally used to running on glucose and all of a sudden you're switching it over. And it has that two week period where it really needs to try to figure out its transition. I just don't think now is the time. Now is not the time to be putting your body under any kind of stress. So I don't even think people should be in severe caloric deficits right now. I think that people should be in just neutral diets that allow them to stay lean and get healthy but don't push them too far. Anyhow, I hope that that helps. Um, Diamond Edge, yeah, you're very welcome for answering your question. Hang on here, I'm looking for a couple other questions. Let's see, bear with me guys. Uh, hang on. Okay, yeah, so Jimmy had asked how antibodies actually work when it comes down to destroying a pathogen because the antibodies themselves don't actually destroy the pathogen all the time. A lot of times what they'll do, so if we have, okay, let's say for example, someone has received this virus before. They've gotten it, maybe they had symptoms, maybe they didn't. Okay, well, what's generally going to happen is their body's going to recognize that this virus is there. So those antibodies are going to go and they're going to envelop it, but they're also going to trigger the innate immune system, the phagocytes, the lymphocytes, the macrophages to do their job 
and to remove it. Okay, so it calls in sort of the troops. And that's basically what's happening. That's the idea behind being exposed to a virus of some kind. You know, I've talked to a number of people that actually have thought that maybe they even had this uh, a couple of months ago when a lot of people were complaining about respiratory issues because there a couple of months ago, there was a big influx of people having some serious respiratory uh, viral infections. People just didn't know what was going on. They're testing negative for the flu and it's complicated. I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak to it once again, but I can just talk about my experience as a human. I met a lot of people that in January and in February were dealing with similar symptoms, but I think that quite frankly, we didn't have testing at that point in time. So it made it kind of difficult. I can't speak to that. So I can't give like a professional opinion on it. I can give a personal opinion. Point is, I think there's probably a lot of people that are actually are innately immune because they had exposure to it. Um, but anyway, just to put that into perspective of how that works, immune system activates, um, neutralizes something, and then it now has the GPS tag to be able to trigger the macrophages and the phagocytes and everything like that to come in and take care of it in the future. Now, what's interesting is when you look at antibodies, antibodies have what is called affinity but they also have something that is called, uh, basically they have the ability with affinity is their power to be able to bind to a pathogen and neutralize it. Okay, but then we have another piece of the equation. Okay, within that, there's also um, what is called, uh, it's almost called acidity, avidity, sorry. You've got affinity and avidity. So affinity is the ability of an antibody to actually neutralize something. But a lot of times, antibodies that have a high affinity and ability to neutralize things are pretty limited in their scope. Okay. We're always producing new antibodies. That's what's great, but we don't always have antibodies that can neutralize multiple things. So the higher the affinity, the more potent that antibody is. Now, a lot of times you'll have antibodies that have what's called high avidity, which means they have the ability to neutralize multiple things, but not as aggressively. So I want you to think of it like this. You have one type of antibody that can go in and neutralize something, neutralize a virus and take care of it, okay? But its sole job is that. It's like a specialist. It's like a special operations or it's like a special forces person that can come in. Its job is to be a sniper and neutralize it. And it's good at that one thing, but it's very lethal when it does it, okay? The other side of the equation is one that has high avidity. That's going to be more like a generalist. And that generalist may not be good at sniping, but he could be very darn good at at least saying, hey, wait a minute, that guy's bad, that guy's bad, that guy's bad, that guy's bad. Go ahead and take care of them, natural killer uh, T cells. Does that make sense to everybody? I just wanna make sure that that makes sense. So everyone um, following me on that, I just wanna make sure, bear with me guys, I'm trying to, well, where'd my chat box go? There we go. Okay, if that just makes sense, just go ahead and, there we go, okay, cool. Sounds like people are making, making sense to people. Uh, Rocktiv, thanks for the vitamin video. Really appreciate your hard work. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of people ask about bee pollen. I can't really comment on that, to be completely honest. I don't really know too much about bee pollen in the immune system, to be completely honest. Um, is there anything we can do to prepare our bodies? I'm going to get into that. Um, already says too lengthy. Yeah, I'm sorry this is too lengthy. It's a live broadcast. It's not designed to be something you're going to get in two minutes. Apple cider vinegar with the mother. Okay, so the apple cider vinegar, I don't think it's going to like save the day, but I do think that it's going to at least help you out when it comes down to you know supporting your gut biome during this time. Hey, can I ask everyone if they can to please hit that thumbs up button? That way we can get a bunch of likes on this and YouTube can see that this is good content. I want to make sure that everyone knows uh, that YouTube knows that, hey, this is good content. And a lot of times you're hitting that thumbs up button, hitting that like button helps that out. Um, let's say we've got Madrid in the house. Yeah, so apple cider vinegar. It's definitely not going to hurt. And the thing is, apple cider vinegar at the very least is going to at least help you control those blood sugar rises and falls, right? So if you have apple cider vinegar right after a meal, at least it's going to make it so you don't feel like you're going to succumb to those cravings. I definitely don't want people to run into a situation where they're um, regressing and turning back to sugar and things like that right now. This is not a good time to be triggering inflammation like that. Uh, sugar does wreak some havoc on our body when it comes down to inflammation. So I just want everyone to be careful there. Uh, Midleb says, can you pl please provide links to vitamin D with K complex and a vitamin C that you can recommend? Haven't seen vitamin D with K at drugstores. Yes, I'll put some links in the description after I'm finished with this. So anyone that's interested in that, I'll put links afterwards. Um, I was also going to make a note. A lot of people have been asking because like Thrive Market got wiped out, like totally, I shouldn't say wiped out, but they're delivery times are really, really backlogged right now. So they're doing a really good job right now of just kind of contributing humanitarian uh, in a humanitarian way, right? So they're matching donation amounts. They're helping contribute to make sure that people that can't get food right now can get food. So 
I've actually literally been instructed by them to let people know that right now is not the time to sign up for Thrive. So if you're looking at joining Thrive, it might not be the best time. So I talk about this in my other videos, but I put a link down below so you can still go to Thrive and check them out. But right now, everything they're doing is focused on the humanitarian side of things and donating to families that are in need. Because right now, obviously, there are a lot of people that are having a hard time getting groceries. They're having a hard time getting food. And Thrive is a perfect place to be getting those pantry staples. So they've done a really good job just helping people out in that case. So anyway, link is still down below. Still highly recommend you check them out. Just give them a couple of weeks before you potentially sign up anyway. Um, sorry, some more questions. Do calories matter for immunity? What if you're not hungry on keto? That's a tough question because I think that it's all going to depend, you know, relative we'll take a probiotic supplement in this case. Personally, night, if I'm going to take them, um, not the biggest fan of probiotics, unless you can get your hands on some really high quality ones. And most of them aren't the highest quality, uh, to be completely honest, they usually don't last. Uh, someone asked how many milligrams of zinc I would usually say 50 milligrams of zinc is probably the best one. Um, uh, Okay, I wanna talk about vitamins that are gonna help boost your immune system a little bit because I touched on in my live broadcast two days ago, vitamin C, vitamin D, magnesium, and that whole correlation, which for those of you that are watching right now, if you did not watch the other live broadcast from the other day, I really think that you should go back and watch it, but I'll touch a little bit on it now. Basically, what it comes down to is vitamin C is essentially worthless without vitamin D and vitamin D is worthless without vitamin C. They need to work together. That is imperative because vitamin D ends up getting synthesized because of vitamin C and vitamin D is what signals the immune system to attack an invader. So when an immune cell notices a pathogen is there. Okay. So remember everything we talked about the James Bond thing, all that virus comes in and what happens is the first phase of our immune system is to identify something is wrong. This guy should not be here. Tag the virus. The virus gets tagged, okay? Then it's the job of the natural killer cells to come in and take care of that virus. Well, here's the problem. When that uh, immune cell tags that pathogen, it calls the natural killer cell. Well, it sends a vitamin D signal and that's what triggers the natural killer cell. So its phone is vitamin D. Without vitamin D, it cannot send a signal. So then you have just rogue soldiers running around your body, not knowing what to fight. If you wanna be able to have the GPS target work with your immune system, there has to be vitamin D. Vitamin C is simply a fuel for the immune cell. Vitamin D is the command center. So you can see they're both very, very important. But in order to utilize and actually have vitamin D turn into its usable form, you need magnesium. Because every time you take D2 and convert it into D3, whether it's from the sunlight or from your food, you are not, you are not able to turn it into its usable form without magnesium. And guess what the mineral that most all of us are deficient in is? Magnesium. So I've been telling everyone, however much I can, magnesium, magnesium first, vitamin D second, and if you're up for it, a pretty decent mega dose of vitamin C. Am I a doctor? I have to say this again. No, I'm not. But I can tell you from my own experience and my own research that all this stuff adds up. And magnesium is a catalyst for 400 different enzymatic reactions within our body. It's a cofactor for so much. Um, I'll go ahead and actually in the description down below after you watch this video, I'll put links to some of the things that I recommend because people are going to ask magnesiums, things like that. So I'll put some links down below. There's a magnesium link down below already. Um, again, everyone's running into inventory issues, so I can't promise anything. I just, I'm putting them down below. Now, the other day I talked a little bit about B vitamins, okay? What we have to remember is that B vitamins still play a very, very big role in how our body works with the immune system, okay? So they're... When we're first building our innate immunity and our adaptive immune system, most of the vitamins, okay, like B6, B9, B12, they're also applied in our bodies to ultimately boost up that whole process. So basically what that means is most of the vitamins like B6 and B9 and B12 are involved in the production of antibodies. So if you are deficient in those B vitamins, that's when you run into a problem. Now, this is where I legitimately get concerned, and this is not to bash anybody, but I legitimately get concerned with some people that are uh, vegan because it is very common to be deficient in B vitamins if you are vegan. And now people that know how to eat a vegan diet properly get those B vitamins. So this is not to bash vegans. This is to say that it is a concern because when you don't have B vitamins, it's hard to produce antibodies. Even the, the British Journal of Nutrition published something. So all the micronutrients like uh, vitamin A, B6, B12, 
even folic acid, they're all essential for antibody production. Okay. That has been found. So make sure you're getting your B vitamins in, whether it's through your food. The simplest way to probably do that is good old fashioned nutritional yeast. Okay. So in the meal plan that I'm putting out tomorrow for free, by the way, a video that I'm posting tomorrow, okay, I am going to be talking about all these different things. And I'm going to be talking about foods that you can consume that are going to also help boost your immune system during this time. Okay. Again, also we want to get in shape, but we also want to be boosting our immune system. So I'm going to be talking on that stuff a lot. Um, let's see. So, Magnesium rich foods. Uh, Stephanie, that's a great question. The thing is with magnesium foods, you're looking at things like almonds and we've actually done some fun little case studies on this. But if you, to get the daily recommended allowance of magnesium, you'd have to basically eat like 3000 calories worth of almonds. So really right now, the soil is so depleted, we don't get the minerals that we really should need. So magnesium is probably in the three to five supplements I would recommend that people really, really focus on taking. And I'm not going to even talk about those supplements in today's video because not all of them have to do with immunity. And this isn't about just pushing supplements. I'm not doing that at all. That's not what I want to do. Um, vitamin K with vitamin D. Yes, definitely. I talked about that in the other video. Uh, how much sun should you get for vitamin D production? It all depends on where you live and it all depends on your skin type because we all have different uh, ability to synthesize it. Usually the safe amount is 15 to 30 minutes is what they say daily. Of course, if you're living in a dark environment, it can be kind of tough, right? Uh, Janet says 800 milligrams of magnesium. Okay. Yes, that's quite a bit to be completely honest. So as long as it's not making you run to the bathroom, then I think you're probably in good shape. Um, I put, again, I put a link down below for magnesium that I would recommend that's sustained release because it's dimagnesium malate. Also magnesium glycinate is one that I would recommend and magnesium threonate. Okay. Those are the kinds of magnesium. Um, the one that I linked down below is just a general magnesium. Uh, let's see. So, uh, lipospheric vitamin C. Yeah. Liposomal vitamin C. Um, that would be a really strong one too. I can put a link down for purethrized vitamin C, which is one that I'm on the advisory board for that I, that my patent is involved with. So those of you that have followed me long enough know that I have a couple of different patents on uh, some delivery technologies and things like that. Uh, so with Pure Thrive Vitamin C, I'm involved with the patent in that. Problem is everything's back ordered. to be completely honest. So I'll link it down below. But the truth is it's, it's probably going to take one to two weeks for people to even get anything. So I didn't bother linking it. Um, other questions that are coming in. Would a focus on cellular health help inflammation? Um, you know, resveratrol could play a big role. The thing is, is, you know, antioxidants are going to be very important. And next week I have a video coming out surrounding antioxidant rich foods and beverages. And I think that that's going to be really important right now. What we want to do right now is kind of the opposite of what I'm normally preaching in terms of causing a hormetic stressful response in the body. This is our time to actually allow our body to kind of have some cushion. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, what minerals don't have to be taken together? Uh, magnesium is one of them, to be completely honest. Uh, magnesium is pretty powerful and I don't recommend you take it with anything else. Uh, I can, it's easier to tell you what not to take with minerals versus uh, what you can take because there's very, very, very few. I would say, um, you know, copper you could take individually, I, but remember copper and zinc deplete each other. So you just have to be careful of that. Uh, is dimagnesium malate the same as magnesium malate? Uh, it's just two different forms of magnesium in it. That's the only difference. Let's see what kind of zinc is the best honestly whatever zinc is going to not give you an upset stomach <laughs> let's see some other good questions coming in let's see sorry guys scrolling through some questions here let's see black seed oil can't really comment on that one um Colloidal silver. I know there's a lot of people talking about colloidal silver right now. I just, I just don't know, you know, cause the FDA has sent out so many warning letters to colloidal silver companies right now, because they think that it's like really pushing, um, I don't know, the wrong message, but then again, we always have to question everything. Right. So I haven't done enough research on colloidal silver to really make a comment on it. And I really only like to comment on things that I have researched and vetted out. It, cod liver oil. I'm glad someone brought up cod liver oil because I do feel like since vitamin A and vitamin D are so critical when it comes down, these birds are laughing at me. Anyway, because vitamin A and D are also so critical for antibody formation and since vitamin D is so critical for the overall activation of the T cells properly, uh, cod liver oil is a great source of that because you actually get the bioavailable retinol A. The thing with if you're taking just a regular retinol or a regular vitamin A supplement, um, 
you're getting it in essentially a synthetic form, which can ultimately cause a chain reaction of depletion down the line. So you want to get it in a solid form as much as possible, like in a food form. So usually like eating some kind of, um, you know, fatty fish, eating sardines with the actual bone and with the skin, which is gross for some people, it's probably one of the best ways to get vitamin A and vitamin D. So remember vitamin A, vitamin D, and then also all the B vitamins to actually help build antibodies. Okay. That way you're giving your body what it needs. Okay. But then you want the vitamin C to be able to actually fuel the immune cells. So everything's involved in the signaling and the building. And then we have to give our body what we can to actually fuel the immune cells. Uh, what are my thoughts on coenzyme Q10? Uh, okay, when it comes down to immunity, coenzyme Q10 doesn't really, I, I'm not well versed in that. Coenzyme Q10 is all about delivering more bang for the buck to the cell. What that means is when you're looking at an overall energy balance in the body, you have um, what's called the electron transport chain. Hey, actually, quickly, before I dive into this, can everyone that's watching this video, can you go ahead and hit that thumbs up button, please? Yeah, this is a much lighter broadcast than uh, the one was last week, so I definitely need your guys' help to get this out there and, and hit that thumbs up button. Anyhow, what happens is you have the energy powerhouse inside a cell. You have the mitochondria, right? And what ends up happening is the electron transport chain delivers a pulse of well, essentially electricity, right, down this chain of electrons, and it delivers energy, ATP, into the cell. Now, this is a, just a massive chaotic response within the body or reaction within the body. As electricity is kind of coming down that pathway, it creates rogue electrons that go out and cause oxidative stress. So every time you eat, every time you create energy, anything like that, okay, your body is creating waste. The more energy you have, the more waste you also have. Okay, abundant energy that doesn't die is a good sign of being able to actually fight the waste that's produced by energy. So envision this for one second. I promise I'm getting to my point here. You have um, a lot of energy first thing in the morning and that's great, okay? But then later on in the day, you crash. Well, a lot of times what could kind of be happening in almost a visual sense is you're creating so much energy that you're stepping on the throttle so much, you're creating so much waste that your body has to deal with that waste. So it's a natural process. But the faster that we can deliver and more efficiently we can deliver energy into the cell, the less energy gets wasted and the more that actually goes into the cell properly. So long story short, being uh, like focusing on coenzyme Q10, focusing on even a ketogenic lifestyle if you've already been doing it or fasting, all makes it so that that electron transport chain is more efficient. It increases the ability for that energy to transfer down that electron transport chain faster okay and that therefore means you're delivering a more powerful punch at the cellular level now if you think of a dropping a bowling ball from five feet how much power is it going to have when it hits the ground a good amount but if you drop that same bowling ball from 30 feet think about what it's going to do it's going to drop and it's going to slam into the ground with a lot more force that's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about delivering power into the cell coenzyme q10 and things like that basically increase the height of which you're dropping the bowling ball if that makes sense uh, uh, diane thank you very much so guys there's lots of questions coming in uh, what are my thoughts on ginseng i love ginseng for, as an immune as an immune supplement can't really comment on it but ginseng in terms of that's what i switched to halfway through today um so Brendan Beauregard says energy equals West waste question mark in, in a way it does. So the more energy, it's just like if you take a, a vehicle, I mean, I'm going to use a gasoline or internal combustion engine. So it makes sense. If you have a Lamborghini and you step on the gas, sure. You have a lot of energy, but you're also creating a lot of waste, right? Okay. It's just, whereas if you have also in the world of an internal combustion, combustion engine, maybe you have a Honda civic step on the gas. Yeah. You can go full throttle. You're not going to be as fast as a Lamborghini but you're also going to be producing less waste, right? So it all depends. Like the more energy you have, the more of a Lamborghini you are, as there's a loud, obnoxious car in the background. Um, thoughts on a veggie greens powder? I have a video coming out next week when I'm talking about just different things that you can do for fasting in the immune system, because I do feel like when people are fasting is when they should be supplementing like a greens powder afterwards, just to make sure they're getting all their nutrients in. Um, so let's See, some good questions here. Lost another three stones so far. Awesome. That's great. Fermented veggies. Okay, so fermented veggies, as far as the immune system is concerned, sure, that's powerful. But I think the bigger piece there is just looking at your gut health, right? Because so much of the immune system is in our gut. So if we can support our gut, if we can do that, then of course we potentially allow our immune system to. Now, again, I talked about this the other day, but I think the big piece with our gut health is less about what our gut does for us in a healing process and more about what our gut 
does in a negative way to destroying our immune system when it's in bad shape. So we just need to make sure our gut is in good shape. I don't think that personally, a stronger gut is going to make you have a stronger immune system. But I do think that a weaker gut is going to make you have a weaker immune system. I think most of us are living in a weakened digestive state and we're living in a, with a weak microbiome. And the reason that I say weak is because we're in dysbiosis where we have just a large imbalance of gram negative bacteria to gram positive bacteria, causing the leakage of lipopolysaccharoids, everything like that into the bloodstream. Basically what that means is everything I've been talking about as far as antibodies go, everything that I've been addressing, what it would essentially mean is that all those antibodies are going to work fighting off toxins that are leaking from our own gut when they should be going to work fighting viral infections and viral situations like this, right? That's the big thing. We got to do what we can to make sure our body actually can target what it needs to target and it's not wasted targeting just useless garbage because of poor metabolic health. Um, Bob said, my thoughts on mega dosing vitamin C. I've talked this a few new, t a few times. And the thing is, is I can only speak to my own personal experience with this because if you talk uh, vitamin C, you open yourself up to a lot of scrutiny because so many people are anti mega dosing vitamin C. So I personally take a ton of vitamin C. I take a ton. And when I say that I'm taking between seven and 15,000 milligrams per day, uh, when I'm tired. Now, does that mean that I think you should not necessarily? You need to find your upper tolerable intake and you need to, I have to say this for full disclaimer reasons, consult with a medical professional because megadosing vitamin C has its pros, but it also has its cons. If you're not properly hydrated, then sure, it can cause some issues, but you want to make sure you're hydrated so that if you do take too much, you excrete it out rather than it forming oxalates within your body. Uh, so as uh, BJ, you're very welcome. Says thanks for your support during this time. Yeah, honestly, guys, I think this is just a great time to be able to do some live discussions and be able to have some fun. Um, I don't know if everyone here has notifications on, but I would appreciate if you would turn them on because we've been definitely battling issues with YouTube lately. It's just been super tough. Um, and I think the reason is, is just more and more people are coming on here, putting content out and it starts making it tougher for the good content to float to the top. And those of you that have watched my channel for the number of years know that we really put a lot of effort into good content. And it's a bummer because then you get people that just spread misinformation or people that have no references whatsoever, put no scientific knowledge into anything. Um, and they just put their vlog style videos out and they ultimately get the views. So the channels, you know, like myself and the channels, even like Dr. Berg's, you know, um, some of these amazing people, even Dr. Peter Atia, like all of our good channels kind of get muffled. It's a really bummer. So anyhow, just ask that people turn on notifications. That way you can see when we post videos. Um, let's see. YouTube saved us. No more. We're not in trouble. It's just, it's just been a, it's just been a struggle recently in the last like six months as YouTube's algorithms have changed uh, to make it so that, you know, it favors more entertainment based content because they're trying to compete with Netflix and everything like that. And my content's not entertaining. It's not designed to be entertaining. It's supposed to be educational, which is kind of what YouTube was formed on. Um, it's all good. Okay. Let's see. Is sugar from potato and rice inflammatory? It all depends on your own response to that. Will you do more live streams and maybe an exercise one? I would love to do more live streams, but I want to make sure that we get a good feedback, good turnout on these things. Uh, my thoughts on oil of oregano. I know someone else had asked that too. You know, it does have some pretty powerful immune boosting properties. I probably should do a more specific video on it. What I don't want everyone to do is try think is thinking that there is just a magic pill for all of this, because that's the thing. And if there's one thing that you've learned from my channel is that there isn't a magic pill for all this stuff. All you can do is support your own immune system. Okay. In a way, you're kind of born with your immune system, right? You're born with your own innate immune system, what is there naturally. That's kind of what's given to you through the placenta, right? But then you have the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system is just what's there underlying, ready to attack. And then the adaptive immune system is what adapts. You can only build your adaptive immune system based on what you're exposed to. It's your innate immune system that is basically what allows you to get sick or not. The adaptive, you know, there's people that have conditions where their adaptive immune system doesn't work as well or they're immunosuppressed, but it all starts with their innate immune system. Their innate immune system isn't working well, so it doesn't allow the adaptive immune system to work well. So everything that we can do is just give our body the tools necessary to fuel our immune system. What I don't want people to think is that you can take a bunch of elderberry, you can take a bunch of things and combat this novel virus, right? That's not how it works. We're not going to take something that's just going to prevent it. 
but we can support our own immune systems. And that's why I'm doing these boring educational videos, right? It's all boring, nonsense crap, except you need it because you need to know how your immune system works. So I know that people get annoyed with me talking and rambling about this stuff, but you have to educate yourself. If you don't educate yourself on this stuff, how do you know how to actually nourish the immune system that you need, right? So anyhow, I know it's kind of confusing, but and it frustrates me sometimes, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to ans answer one more question. I got to go ahead and hop off. Um, oh, that's a good question. Should uh, ginger, lemon juice, and turmeric, black pepper concoction a good immune booster? It is cool that you mentioned that, to be honest, because I think turmeric is really, really, really important. Uh, turmeric is still going to be one of the best natural anti-inflammatories that's out there. Um, the uh, World Health Organization and the Chinese government, and I don't know if the CDC has mentioned it yet, but ibuprofen is one of the worst things that you can take during a virus, uh, specifically a novel virus like this. There's a level of uh, anti-inflammatory quelling that occurs when you take uh, an anti-inflammatory such as ibuprofen. I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you to take it or not to take it. But point is, is the World Health Organization even put it out that ibuprofen is not good to take right now. So a good alternative, if you are feeling sick and you're not sure what you have, turmeric with a little black pepper or a good quality turmeric supplement would probably be, be a bet to take a, um, a test, right? I'm not even going to say the word, but you all know what I'm talking about. Because if I say it, YouTube will flag this video. Yes, if I say the virus we're all concerned about, YouTube will flag this video. Um, point is, is that you may not you may not have access to the test to see if that's what you have, but you don't you're just concerned because you feel a little bit ill, but you don't want to take ibuprofen because you've been anyway. Point is, turmeric might be a good choice there to at least alleviate some symptoms um, as far as inflammation goes. But what do I know? I'm not a doctor. I'm just some guy on the internet. So anyhow, guys, I gotta hop off. Thank you all so 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 much, and don't forget tomorrow morning. Okay. Tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay. 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm posting the meal plan video. Please try to jump on as soon as I post it. That way it gets out there and people see it. It gets some good attention. You guys are super awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and I will see you all soon.